In this module, we will discuss some modeling challenges and how to address them. So far, we've learned how to model certain types of systems, mechanical systems, electrical circuits from first principles. A challenge that sometimes arises is that we may not be able to derive the model for a physical system from first principles. And so one approach to address this is to use what we will call a black box modeling approach. And one example, one example that we'll discuss in particular is, is using such an approach for modeling batteries. Another challenge that can arise is that sometimes the mathematical models that we've derived, the differential equation or the transfer function, cannot be solved by hand or cannot be solved analytically. And so an approach that we will learn to address those situations is numerical simulation. Black box modeling is, is an alternative to deriving models for physical systems from first principles. So instead of using our knowledge of physics, using Newton's second law, using Kirchhoff's laws, the idea is that we don't understand the physics of the system or we don't attempt to understand the physics of the system and rather we feed the system a known input and observe the output and try and fit a mathematical model that will match that output for for the given input this is something that we've discussed a little bit in the past but try and think about um, or try and recall what some advantages or disadvantages uh, of a black box modeling approach are as compared to a first principles modeling approach. One example where black box modeling is, is often used is with batteries. Um, so one approach for deriving the model of a battery is to, is to examine the sort of the underlying chemistry of the, of the battery. This process can be quite challenging, um, especially for engineers who may not have the, the chemistry background. And as engineers, for our purposes or for the purposes of control, we don't necessarily need a physics chemistry based model. We don't necessarily need to understand what's happening within the, within the battery. We just want to capture the input output behavior. We just want to know how the the current being supplied by the battery will change under different conditions. Commonly, a way that this is accomplished is, is to model the, the battery with an equivalent circuit model. That is to say, we find circuit models that have similar input-output behavior to the battery. The simplest approach is to use a simple resistive model. And so that's what's shown here. And in this case, uh, the battery is simply modeled as having some open circuit voltage, that's the voltage of the battery, and some internal resistance. This is what we would call a static model. Um, so the, the model itself derives from Ohm's law. It is uh, an algebraic model. And if the load changes, i.e. the conditions change or the input to the system changes, the output changes instantaneously, as you can see from this relationship. So if the load on the battery changes, then the current will change instantaneously. In reality, this, this is not a perfect model. Uh, a battery is not a static system. If the load changes, there it will take time for the output to change or the current supplied by the battery to change. It won't happen instantaneously. This simple model, however, is, is nice. Um, it's very easy to use. It's very easy to solve. It can be appropriate under certain conditions. The amount of fidelity that it provides could be sufficient uh, if you are just looking for approximate results or if the load is changing slowly. If the load is changing slowly, then, then treating the model as, as being static is, is appropriate. Another situation where it may be appropriate is if you're doing sort of a system level simulation. And so in this, in this case, you know, you're trying to model the battery, but it's also interacting with the, an electric motor 
and the drive line, etc. What a situation you can have is that the dynamics of the battery are so fast that that they get lost when you compare to the compare them to the dynamics of the other parts of the system. And this is something that may not be completely intuitive, but it's something that we will come back to later in this semester and we will demonstrate it mathematically to try and give you some intuition for why that's the case. Here are two examples of more refined battery models. So these, these models capture the dynamics of the battery. If you change the load, the current or the power supplied by the battery wouldn't change instantaneously. It would, it would take time to react. And these, these models uh, are not algebraic models. They must be modeled by differential equations. And that's because of the, the presence of the capacitors. And so the thing to keep in mind is that these circuits uh, aren't uh, physics-based models of the, of the battery. The battery doesn't literally have capacitors and resistors within it. It's just that the dynamics of these circuits, if you compared you know, the response of the output for a given input, would approximate the dynamics of the battery. In general, you can come up with different types of circuit equivalent models uh, that may be appropriate, appropriate for different types of battery, batteries, a nickel cadmium battery, a lithium ion battery, and different models may be appropriate depending on the fidelity requirements or the accuracy requirements you may have. Most of the models that we've talked about so far um, when we talked about mechanical systems and electrical systems, and then here as we're talking about batteries, we've assumed that they're time invariant. We assume that the different parameters of the system don't change with time. So for example, in the previous slide, oftentimes we would make the assumption that the open circuit voltage of the battery is, is constant, or the resistances and the capacitances that we're, that we're employing aren't changing with time. In reality, that's not the case um, for batteries or for many other systems as well. For example, it's been shown experimentally that the voltage of the battery, the open circuit voltage of the battery, is a function of state of charge and temperature. So SOC uh, means state of charge, and it represents how charged the battery is. Has it been completely depleted or is it fully charged? Furthermore, the internal resistance of a battery has been shown to be a function of the open circuit voltage, the temperature, and whether or not the battery is being charged or if it's being discharged. If we have a situation where these parameters are changing slowly um, as compared to to the dynamics of the other parts of the system, then it's reasonable to treat them as constants. Um, and again, this is something that may not be that intuitive, um, but we will, we will show it mathematically later on. Here are two graphs showing how some of the parameters of, of a battery may change over time. And so the graph on the left shows how open circuit voltage changes with state of charge. Um, so you can see that it, it varies quite a bit, you know, from 3.1 volts to almost 4 volts. And you can also see how there's some variation with temperature. So there's three different traces here for three different temperatures, 0 degrees Celsius, 25 degrees, and 40 degrees. The graph on the right shows how the internal resistance of a battery may change with open circuit voltage and, again, with temperature. As was stated on the previous slide, if the, if the parameters are changing slowly, it may be appropriate to treat them as constants or to treat them as time invariant. And so one, one approach that you may have is you may have a set of battery models that could be switched between based on different environmental conditions. So perhaps, perhaps 
you use a battery, um, one battery model when the temperature is very cold and a different battery model when the temperature is very warm. Other conditions under which you may be able to treat the parameters as time invariant is again if they change slowly compared to the overall dynamics of the system or if the operating conditions of the of the system are, are very narrow. So for example, in practice, um, in an electric vehicle, we do not let the battery run all the way down to zero state of charge. We don't deplete the battery completely, and we don't charge it completely either. We keep it in a narrower band in order to extend the life of the battery. So under those conditions, if we're, if we're keeping the battery in a very narrow or a more narrow range of the state of charge, it may be appropriate to sort of treat the open circuit voltage as a constant. Here is a picture of the actual battery in the first generation electric hybrid Ford Escape. Uh, this vehicle we actually have on the McNichols campus if, if you ever want to see it in person. Just to give you a sense of the size of the battery, this unit basically takes up the ground of the rear cargo area of the Escape, or the area underneath the, the hatchback. Um, so it's, it's quite large. Um, another example is the first generation Ford Fusion, uh, where in that vehicle, the, the battery basically takes up the space behind the rear seat. Um, so it, it basically spans the, the width of the vehicle. Looking at the battery, it, it, it consists of a number of cells that are arranged in series and parallel. So for example, you could imagine that, that this little block is a single cell and it's connected to other cells uh, situated um, around it either in series or in parallel. Putting the, the cells in series affects the overall voltage of the battery. So for example, if we consider that we have a 5 volt cell and we put it in series with another 5 volt cell it'll alter the the voltage output at the at the terminals of the overall battery package um, recall that voltage is a potential difference so if we start at ground, the first cell will bump us up 5 volts, and then the second cell will bump us up an additional 5 volts. So the total difference across both cells is 10 volts. Changing the voltage output of the, of the pack can be important in determining um, how much voltage is needed to drive a particular motor or a particular accessory, etc. The number of cells in parallel affects how much current can be sourced. So again, if we have these two 5 volt cells, if instead of being in series, they're in parallel, um, if you look at the voltage across both cells, um, the voltage across each is 5 volts, where Basically, this whole upper bar is at the same voltage, and this, this whole lower bar is at the same voltage, presuming that the, the wires connecting the batteries have uh, minimal resistance. So putting them in parallel doesn't affect the voltage at the output, but it does affect how much current can be sourced, because in essence, um, you know, this cell is sourcing some current, and this cell is sourcing some current, and the the current flows sum together. And so what that affects in essence is, is how long the battery will last before it's depleted. And that's measured in amp hours. So if the battery is a 10 amp hour battery, that means that it can supply one amp for 10 hours, or it can supply 10 amps for one hour, depending on how you look at it. 